I'd like to introduce Ed Atkins, whose work is in the show. Uh, Ed Atkins is a Berlin-based artist with solo exhibitions at nice places, including the Palais de Tokyo, MoMA PS1, Tate Britain, the Martin Gropiusbaum, other places. And instead of having sort of proper introduction, I have some sort of, you know, meta introduction or theoretical introduction, which <clears throat> Ed Atkins may or may not approve of. That's the risk of the game, you know. Um, for me, my risk. Thinking about, you know, some of the things we've seen today or heard, what's some um, what's curious here is that it's not necessarily because we've been talking about body, but then there's that other thing, let's call it technology. And you know, sometimes they're opposites, sometimes they're presented or viewed as opposites. Some people say, oh, let's put them together, that's a great thing, like cyborgs, or the idea of the cyborgs. That's a fantasy. Um, <clears throat> it, it seems like Ed Atkins is not in that kind of gleeful celebration of such marriages. But then perhaps, maybe without pathos, but with a kind of melancholia, uh, in an interview in Freeze, he speaks of infinite reams of images of bodies always seemingly in lieu, eternally deferred. And um, this business about the marriage of body and technology, or to use another more recent word, enhancement, some people say, well, that can't happen. That's just some sort of weird fantasy. Uh, we're biological beings, we're mortal, period. Some people say um, it is a concrete possibility, it's dangerous and bad, you know, we, we shouldn't have that. Some people, of course, say it's great, and there's the, the Marxist version of saying it's great, it's called accelerationism, if you are curious or if you know already. And I have a feeling that in, uh, for Ed Atkins, he might say something like, sure, we, we may have that, and we may have a lot more enhancement coming, you know, in, rec in uh, not recent years, in fourth, future years. But what about the affect, or affects, I'm never sure uh, the S makes a difference. What about the affect that comes along with such enhancement? And so, uh, Safe Conduct, the video that's in the show, What's the affect of, you know, the steel, the virtual, the flesh, et cetera, et cetera. And it seems to me, and so I'm just setting up, despite the fact that no one asked me to give concluding remarks, this is like a pre-concluding remark, it, it's as if some of the work and um, Mary Chen Dance's work that we, you know, saw a performance of, where there, there may have been a, a kind of mystery of the flesh or a privilege of the flesh. In, in Atkins, despite references to eyelashes and foreskins and their melding and so forth, there's at the very least a sort of strong irony, and I don't mean in the sense of humor, but in the sense of distanciation. So with that strange introduction, I hand over to Ed. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, for that very strange introduction, but very... Um, yeah, it feels like it sort of spun me a little at the beginning. Um, this is going to be very different to Brooke's extraordinarily lucid and, and, and profoundly sort of clear um, lecture. Um, my style is a lot more digressive. So what I'm going to do is, is sort of talk live over bits of videos and try to sort of plot something of why the work has ended up being what it is. Um, so really, it's, a, it's an artist talk, I suppose. So I'm going to sort of marry very practical information with hopefully a kind of more, um, a stranger story of how I arrived at certain kind of uh, conceits within the work, which probably make, well, they definitely make some sort of terrible sense to me, but which I've sort of forced the rhyming of. So you're gonna have to excuse certain amounts of um, probably misreading of things. Um, I feel I've got perfect dispensation now to just waffle about it. It up. So yes, back to safe conduct, back to realism, or well, back to uh, what I guess sort of lazily often calls, and you know lazily, and maybe I'm just too defensive, people call things, uh, call the works of uh, uncanny or within the uncanny valley in some way. And obviously that stuff is, is very important, but I think it, that's a sort of shortcut 
which is overly familiar. So it's in the same way that I started to decry anyone calling the figures in the videos avatars, simply because of the ubiquity of the term, it became important to like wrestle with it again. Um, so I plucked, I, I sort of went with surrogate, um, which has its own problems, obviously, and it's much more loaded in, in other directions, but seems to sort of speak a bit more to do with uh, the kind of um, crash test dummy often, you know, that these figures so often go through things in, instead of a real body. They're a kind of uh, test, you know, like, like a crash test dummy flung down an elevator shaft or something. You see what happens to the body in them. Obviously, like a crash test dummy, it's still not a body. Um, where am I going with this? I think what I would like to do is just talk a little bit about how I, how I got to this point. I'm sorry, I've been sort of thrown off about this. But, so, when I first started making the computer-generated videos, I did, I'd been making a lot of sort of more normal videos by pointing a camera at things and filming things. But I'd also been trying to write quite a lot about uh, structural materialist tendencies in artists' moving image, which um, would hark back to the 60s and 70s in a kind of anti-illusionary uh, filmmaking, as in work that tried to sort of um, stop you from, from the suspension of disbelief that's required for watching, for being immersed in moving image work. Um, and, you, and I suppose classically that would be somehow showing the celluloid, showing the material, or, or revealing the index of the, the, the actual object that is producing the magical display of light and the sound, and whatever. And it always had, I guess, that also kind of extends into a kind of a way to undermine or rebut the ideological tendencies of industrial cinema. For example, um, for some reason, Disney always pops into my head as sort of hammered by Peter Gidow. Um But what that meant, it, it was very much grounded in um, somehow being able to touch everything body of the maker, the person fumbling with the camera, touching everything, making sure that uh, they were sufficiently spoiling the kind of uh, the, the, the fluidity of the illusion. So again, that would be, yeah, revealing the projector, maybe the fluttering of the, of the projector that's in the room as you watch the thing. The kind of constantly insisting of, of the, the, the presence of the material source. And obviously through digital media, it's, it's not the same. One can't necessarily just um, reveal the thing. You know, there is not necessarily a kind of literal um, deconstructing if you go on with, a, with a prior analog modes of uh, moving image production. Um, and there's a kind of full, extraordinary sleight of hand that is achieved by, by now, certainly, in the kind of absconding of whatever material source there might be, or at least the material the index of matter involved in the production of a moving image, or any, like any piece of digital media, really. Um, <clears throat> so in trying to write about this, I was also dealing with my father uh, having terminal cancer, which sort of you know, exploded around his body. It was very, very short and violent, and sort of horrible, and hugely affecting. Um, and weirdly, trying to write about uh, digital moving image production, structural materialism, and, uh, and death, necessarily this thing is sort of intertwined. And uh, I've been reading around representation in, in one of the texts, which I'm pretty sure I've now, by now totally mangled in my retelling of it, in my convincing that it is a kind of interesting thing, is um, a piece called The Two Versions of the Imaginary by Maurice Blanchot. Uh, in, in which he sort of, uh, among other things, talks about the apprehending of a, of a cadaver, a dead body. And, uh, and he describes the dead body as something that sort of oscillates between ludicrous material presence. There's nothing heavier than a, than a dead body. There's nothing more there. It freaks and it sinks and it, you know, all of that stuff. And at the other end is the kind of spiritual, memorial, ethereal aspect, and that the dead body, or at least in the moment of death, this, this is what happens. And, and we exist somewhere in between. We can't really reach either of these end points. And that 
to become a sort of representation of yourself is to, to become a dead body. I've kind of since obviously not really hung on to that as a truth, but it started to lead me down a particularly strange, convoluted, figurative track around uh, high definition digital media. Digital media that, you know, a lot of it's the technological, technological push of um, highly spec CGI animation is towards more and more convincing appearance and the appearance uh, and, and also disappearance. You know, if you look at an explosion in a movie, you're not really supposed to note that it was done on a computer rather than a real explosion. You know, great technicians in these worlds, they require their work to disappear in view and uh, to not break the illusion. Um, but for me, the, this, you know, this, at this end would be this kind of uh, the disappeared, the ethereal, the dematerialized. And, you know, again, there's an asterisk after that, as would be a, a term like immaterial, which obviously is a kind of ludicrous um, non-truth in a way. You know. um, so the, 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 um, at, at one end would be this, this digital thing that doesn't really have a place, that doesn't necessarily have one indexical thing, it doesn't have a unique status, it doesn't sort of even reproduce in a kind of mechanical sense. Potential for this file, for example, is that it's, there, there could be millions of them. And at this point, I could reproduce them relatively losslessly, which is one of those words terms and coined around developments in technology. Losslessness, which is a great, it's a great word. Um, and then at the other end would be this, this move within the technology to kind of address the body of the audience in more and more kind of pummeling ways uh, through surround sound and IMAX and things that have this kind of uh, overloading aspect that, you know, one's seat might rumble just as much as your eyes are sort of bleeding from the car chase or something. You know. um, and I started probably through just dealing with my own things to sort of marry these things up. Um, uh, so initially I was making videos that uh, were a real thing. I was using a nice HD camera, which was sort of freshly minted at that time. Um, and I wrote chunks about high definition and this kind of unreality or sort of excess of, you know, that maybe we don't want to see every pore on an actor's face. So you don't want to see something at 48 frames a second because it, it doesn't look real in the status of reality in relation to those things. But I was generally just filming effects. I'd point the camera at the sun, for example, just to get the lens for that, just to kind of, whatever means I could would be to describe the technology's presence, to retrieve it. And it, what's interesting is particularly with CGI and maybe even in this scene, for example, there were sort of bits of lens flares going on whenever the fluorescent tubes flicker. There's, I mean, the resolution of the project is not terrific, but in the, in the spotlight of the kind of slight dawdling bit of dust motes and smoke and stuff. Um, but, uh, and then in other, in other things that I'll show you in a bit, there's a lot of, kind of focus pulling. And I, I realized that in a way that I was trying to hold on to analog um, tangibility by kind of overly performing, excessively performing the faults of the camera. So when you watch TV nowadays, the ubiquity of the lens flare is totally and it has a, apparently, which I would doubt now, but it's sort of, you can see that the desire is that it's authenticated. It's, that it feels like the fallibility of the technology of the, the thing kind of relates to a, a realism or a sensation of the performance of the real. Um, and so at a certain point in about 2012, and I, I also, I never had any protagonists in these videos. There was never a subject. There was often a narrator with a long, rather horrible sort of, um, Object monologues over the top of these strange flickering things. They're not necessarily good videos. Um, but I really wanted a, a person in there. I wanted a body, you know. And I had a, I had a great tutor at the time, this, this guy called Ian White, who was a former and curator in London. And he saw my first sort of foundering and stuff. He was positive the idea that I was, I was making dead men. I mean, I told him about my father and stuff, and he sort of latched onto that. But it was always quite productive, and I think it generally still is, is to sort of deliberately name something what it is clearly not, and see what happens, you know, discursively, if nothing else. Um, and this sort of, this repleteness of the body, of the dead body, the dead body, or a dead body, in this case, my dad's dead body, his presence, the kind of excess, the, 
hysterical sensation around that. There's a great book, by the way, uh, called Love's Work by someone called Gillian Rose, in which she describes, uh, she's writing it while dying of cancer. She describes uh, a, a stoma on her side, the colostomy bag dangles off of it. And the fecundity of the material, the shit that unfurls unceremoniously into this bag. Oh, here, here comes the music. Um, I'll just keep talking over it and pretending you can't see it. Um, uh, uh, and I, I think that for a long time the, the videos were edited and put together in a way to be in a kind of horror vacuum, like just really filling them with all of the sensational overloads and also the kind of profound irredeemable loss that uh, the encounter of a dead loved one brings. No, it's alright, it's not, it's coming back, don't worry. So, just at the moment, this guy, this kid, is playing a piece by the composer called Jörg Frey. It's a very, very simple four bar flute. Extended circular music. Very easy to play, very hard to play well. So, I'll talk about this work in a time. I wanted to listen to the background, but I think it Anyway, this place of loss um, becomes profound in terms of its kind of um, metaphoric situating with uh, other aspects of the digital, say, the impossible idea of retrieving all of the bodies and the stories that go into, say, the making of an iPhone <laughs> or the downloading of a video. What, what, a, what a server farm really feels like, how sweaty power-consuming and ludicrous there. Um, and that loss, obviously, I guess in a way, in its irretrievability, and yet the fact that it can be mourned, feels tangible. One could potentially understand these things as much without ever getting them back. But one of the things that I wanted, and this is a very Freudian, yes, so I think I'm out of the coding, would be its Essentially about not even knowing that a loss has happened, that the loss, uh, you know, the transmuting of melancholia into mourning, as in reparative uh, mourning, <coughs> is potentially, in the state of these videos at least, irretrievable. And that, that becomes another thing in the fact that all of the videos are loops, they just start again, you know, this kind of Sisyphean rhythm. And they, they're also quite purgatorial. I mean, this one, more obviously than others, as much as it's a cell. But that there is a sense of this contraptives. And, and this, this, this body of works, there are nine videos that constitute old food. And in every single one of them, the characters are crying. And someone asks why they're crying. And, and I think the only thing is because I made them. You know, and there's a kind of horrendousness to that. I mean, just to give a little context, obviously the, the dream, the ideal of CGI is that you could do anything. So why would you do this, I suppose? You know, in that kind of ludicrous, infinite, relatively infinite kind of idea of potential within something, choice becomes insane, becomes everything. To choose what to represent with this kind of absurd fidelity. And I think I'll just put on a couple of other bits of stuff. So he keeps playing that and then he starts again. Um, this, this one here is also part of the same body of work. It doesn't have a title.
there's like nine of those. <coughs> uh, <laughs> this one doesn't really illustrate my point, actually. Um, just to go back to weeping figures, I think yeah, that's kind of easier to talk about. Um, good, good man, here we are. This guy. There are three figures that cross all of the work. Uh, a man, a boy, and a baby. Their scales are all kinds of fucked up, really, but they're, um, here he is. talk, another one of the landscape ones. This one here. And now for our lesson. Remember, this is bread. 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 And this is wine. Um, where was it? Drink, about drink. Um, so this idea of something being profoundly missing good, good. that potentially comes we out in friends. other ways. You and I. Classics of friends. analytic friends. repressed good, returning. Good. But uh, I suppose just the fascination of marrying up this very material story of the irretrievable uh, aspect uh, of uh, digital media and say a loss that cannot be retrieved no, no. and um i mean in as much as i remember an article that came out maybe, maybe now like three years ago or something that was describing the fact that apple had made one of the first laptops that you couldn't take apart uh, if you took it apart you killed it essentially you know. so the the act of getting involved even if however kind of extraordinarily nerdy you were um, you would end I'm the so life alone. of this thing and you wouldn't be able to it use it again. Um, you could alone. only pull it apart to go, oh, oh, right, that's how that works, whatever. You know. um, but the location of ignorance in relation to all of this stuff is kind of important, I guess, if there is a kind of um, ethics at the heart of some of this stuff. Um, in as much as uh, what became important for me was some kind of magical thinking around the retrieval of bodies. Um, and, you, you know, most of the time the works, the only bodies that are present are that those of the viewer. So the ways in which the works address the viewer, in a very straight way, you know, that they're more often than not the characters stare straight down the camera at you. They've started to kind of shut up entirely. For a long time they talked quite a lot at you and sort of pleaded that you would check a mole on their shoulder or something. Or, you know, that they would, they would sort of try and barter for your empathetic response or to save them in some way, or to corroborate their reality in some way. So more often than not, they're either weeping or they're shitting or they're vomiting or they're trying to eat um, something or, you know, they're doing incredibly uh, bodily things, you know, really simple stuff. In one, uh, a guy sort of downs a, a nice warm glass of urine. Um, at the same time as this, I, I write Can quite a lot of stuff and, and the writing is kind of another push it, it's another hysterical sort of attempt to conjure something. I mean, it's a very, I guess, quite old-fashioned idea of magic in some ways, about the kind of, um, well, you know, Crowley's disease of language or something, that, it, that it potentially kind of is metastatic in relation to language. That's what magic, magic words are in some way. Um, but it sort of bears holding on to, I think, as a kind of uh, act that even if it's just held as a kind of figurative thing, but it still functions. It, you know, that is potentially affected terrain. Um, another thing that became very important to me was the kind of status of this, of, of, of figuration and literality. I never know, is it literality or it should be literalness? I mean, that's clunky, right? Literality. Um, and, 
and, and, and trying to, to sort of think through, say, a lot of the, the language that surrounds digital media. So, for example, the, obviously all of these videos are rendered, and I send them off to a render farm where they are turned into their sort of finished product, and you know, several thousand computers get busy um, producing these things because one computer would take sort of a year to do it. Or something. And you buy render points. Obviously, the language of rendering is of the abattoir, really. You know, it's from it's from a process of boiling bones and rendering fats and things. So it has this kind of, you know, not exactly hidden um, undercurrent of its uh, its inheritance. You know? And and a lot of the language around digital media is is insanely physical. This comes from a kind of lexicon of very visceral, um, more or less abject or sort of corporeal stuff, you know? Um, which is obviously, I mean, maybe not. It's just very, it's always been very interesting to me. That there is a kind of appositeness in the kind of the failure and the lack that's involved at the heart of this, of rendering these things. And then it's kind of, you know, that the language is yet another in its sort of pathetic arsenal of trying to become a real thing, you know, and if, if its sort of mode of representation, or at least this, is in some way murderous, you know, in as much as its sort of desire is to be, um, th th you would, it would be no different than its subject in some ways, or the thing that it was trying to represent. But again, the question in a way of, uh, I mean, if you watch most encounters with CGI, I guess, in, in, in industrial cinema, are spectacular. You know, you would want to render superheroes and fantasies that are agreed upon as fantasies. Um, and it always felt like all I really wanted to see was someone just sitting there. You know, I wanted to see um, the idling of, a, of, of the potential within CGI, in a way. There's a, there's a thing called idle animations. When someone's making a video game, for example, and the protagonist is in the center of the screen, you're not making them move or jump or shoot or whatever. Someone's job will be to make animations that are sort of convincing, just idling things. Some of the more flashy stuff now has them sort of check their finger. But it's this fascinating sort of never-ending little loops of I'm ready to run. And, you know, like, it's an extraordinary thing to sort of let one of these things dawdle for as long as possible. And there was a piece actually by an artist called Simon Martin. She featured this strawberry poison dark tree frog rendered in exquisite sort of, you know, like a boiled sweet on a, on a leaf somewhere, covered in little beads of sweat. And it doesn't do anything, it just sits there on this leaf, twitching like a frog does. And it's incredible, it's incredible that, that you know, that it, it allows you to be with it, that it, it, you know, it encourages this encounter that's quite, that sort of starts, I think, to sort of open up a lot of what's exciting and what's maybe happening effectively when hopefully watching my videos. I mean, safe conduct, again, is, is kind of different, but, uh, and again, in as much as, and I, maybe I'll talk more about what safe conduct is. I'm sorry, I'm doing what I do, I think, um, which is say sorry and never finish sentences. Um, I'll put on something. I think that's always a good idea. Um, this is a piece called Happy Birthday from 2014. Every Sunday in 1951, every Sunday in 1951, midweek, 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 50 times. The 
20th century. The 20th century. Little things I should have said and done. Two thousand and six, and I just the scene. It, it's set two thousand and six, June two thousand and six, April two thousand and six, June two thousand and six. Previously, nineteen eighty four. Previously, eighteen seventy two. Eighteen seventy two. It's June eighteen seventy two. Once. I will. And you will. I will. I will. You will. He will. She will. It will. They will. We will. Hmm? We will. I remember. I remember. It's June, 1872. Maybe I love you. Little things. Six months to a year could be six months to a year. And this time next year, <laughs> in a fortnight. Now, in a fortnight. Now. Yeah. Um, 
I wanted to talk about erup eruptive editing, I suppose, as well. I think um, in this effort, if the effort is indeed making dead men, then the kind of um, editing became important that was constantly breaking in on itself, that was kind of constantly undermining aspects of, I guess, a presumption I would hope of an audience about the way that narrative works with editing, um, that montage functions, I suppose, whether theoretically sort of understood on those terms or just felt, you know, the most stuff that one watches. I wanted this thing to constantly break down to, uh, I guess, like a body, like a fart, you know, which if I belched really loudly now, what that would do to the, the room. <laughs> Or if I farted, indeed, indeed. But you know what I mean, like the kind of revenge of the body as a kind of in, 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 in decohering thing, I suppose. The ums and ahs, the kind of belches and the repressed things, or even the kind of the limb that's gone wrong that reminds you you've got a body, because, you know, in a way that that has a kind of equivalence to the anti-illusionary filmmaking of 60s and 70s would be like constantly pointing out the thing, the, the, the lumpy, the stinky bit of celluloid. My gammy leg reminds me I've got a fucking leg and I've got to deal with it or whatever, you know. And I suppose, again, it's a sort of sleight of hand into and, and figured deeply into the work, but it becomes part of the meter of the work, that it's, it's breaking down all the time, that it's sort of disappointing itself with itself, but it also is a kind of another attempt, another sort of bad list of accoutrements that might qualify the videos for a body or for life or something, you know. Um, and in a way there's a kind of, prof I don't know, I re re tried to rehearse the idea that these kind of things are deeply optimistic. In as much as, you know, thank God we don't go through this thing, or that these people are going through these models. I mean, uh, the other thing is every time I talk about these figures, I try to I try to sort of pedantically correct myself and say, well, they're not they're not characters. They have no backstory. They're not real. They're nothing. I mean, they are clearly autobiographically coloured in some way to do with me. They're always men and they're always white. They're in fact usually the same person. I've just reskinned him every so often. So in safe conduct downstairs, you know, when you and I buy all of these models or steal them. Um, and this guy in, in this one, who's also the same figure in, in Safe Conduct, when you buy a 3D model, it's a lot of data. And the things that you can open on a normal computer with normal software would be JPEGs of the skin of these figures or the clothing or whatever, if you've bought some clothes. And then you can open those in Photoshop and, and play havoc with how they would look, you know. And for the guy downstairs for Safe Conduct, I, I sort of beat him up in Photoshop, essentially, um, by, you know, he's covered in bruises and contusions and all manner of stuff. He also appears in a slightly sort of weirder form. And maybe I'll stop at this point after this guy. Uh, this is a snippet from a work that never finished and never really was anything. It was sort of horrible, and I think... Anyway, it's called Performance Capture, and it was an event uh, at the Manchester International Festival about two years ago where uh, I invited people that were also involved in the festival but that would include, you know, invigilators and cleaners but also prima ballerinas and uh, mild celebrities to come and wear a lot of motion capture stuff. In this case, actually, a lot of stuff went terribly wrong with the technology so they had some motion capture gloves and their face was captured. And then each and every one of them would be rendered uh, into this one guy. And they're reciting a very long, sort of horrible soliloquy um, about the process of, processes of, of rendering while it literally happens and also doesn't. And again, I think the status of the digital starts to straddle ideas, convenient ideas about what's literally what's literal and what's figurative in certain ways. And the slippage between them is, is very interesting. But in this case, people would don the thing and audience members could sort of watch them reciting this bananas text 
for like 30 seconds. And then that data would go through to the next room where there was a render farm and a load of technicians sort of cleaning up the information. And then the next room was a cinema, slowly accruing what turned out to sort of be a two hour long, unwatchable, incredibly tedious and rather horrible film. But here's a little bit of it. <laughs> right here, metaphor became the real thing and was held in material abeyance. As a consequence, cause and effect routed the blurt, as it were. Hocus pocus, that thing of the leg becoming more becoming. As it got sore, by the way, some of the Con some of us congregated here in size order, tried to line up the harpoon, as they say, to try to finish the game before bed and otherwise. Sorry. Fuck. I'd really love to be able to retrieve all the pretty human bodies. From the mire figuration, a plea made for the re-embodiment, Lauren active materialism in preserve relation to what you mm, tended to think of as the mystifying effects of that so-called digital life. A corporalism to affirm experience against process, finitude against the fucking pseudo-infinite, proper magic against illusion and against ignorance, a kind of sensitivity like the sweetheart fruiting body in the woods and the writing the very floor with an edible vamped alacrity. The um, animal whom um, bodies were the first to be spared away from the innate contactness with the animal that animated and had the uh, insidious, metaphoric and demonic be east of some shitty ideological consensus that save its most virulent illicit to dump right inside language. I've seen with hush magic word or the laying on of hands again fingers the tact grope and grooming warty finger points and the sweat sparged um, grip the swipe Christ gesture, or the Queen's alloy sword. You can see the problem with this. <laughs> I mean, what's extraordinary is it, it ended up being 200 odd people all, all uh, rendered down to this figure and reading my bit of writing. Basically, it's a very horrible work, I think. I mean, usually I would only put myself through this stuff, but it felt, it felt important to sort of try this thing. Anyway, I apologize for the kind of rambling nature of this talk. Um, I hope that it sort of touched on things that people uh, can go, okay, at least I heard that bit, you know, or, 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 or whatever. And I could happily put on lots of other videos and things. I hope everyone saw Safe Conduct downstairs, and I really, I started talking about that, and then I didn't, so uh, apologies for that. But, um, Maybe that's the end of my presentation, <laughs> I think. Thanks. Thanks.